Hello everyone, hello and welcome to AIDS Map Live special on HIV and stigma. I'm thrilled to be joined by an absolutely glorious panel and we're all really squeezed in very tightly <laughs> together. <laughs> glorious but sweaty panel, so hopefully we're going to get it through the next hour. But if I start with the introductions, first of all, Greg Owen, PrEP and HIV activist, um, co-founder of I Want PrEP Now, part of the improvement team at Terence Higgins Trust and the wearer of the most <laughs> fabulous shoes <laughs> it's today. It's always the shoes, isn't it? Get the shoes, baby. Get yes. the shoes. Yeah. So can you tell us about uh, your shoes today? The shoes are actually on sale from ASOS about four years ago. They were £16. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. So get to ASOS people if you want some red shiny shoes. <laughs> Other online retailers are available. <laughs> Next we have Bakita Cassida, a health researcher at Oxford University. She's currently working on the HIV and infant feeding study called Nourish UK. Also a very talented poet and a writer for NAM AIDS Map. Very good company. Of charity, everyone. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Bikita, I saw you at UK Black Pride yes. last, last week. What was the highlight for you? Oh, the high. My honest answer to this question would be being around so many Black queer people, being around so many familiar faces mm -hmm. as well, filled with joy but then also having no work to do. Saying hi to people on stores, <laughs> going to get some drinks, <laughs> going to dance, and then just walking around again. I know, it. I know, I, I was working nearly all day and you somehow managed to get into like all the work related like photo shoots as if you were working. So <laughs> like, <laughs> cheers for that, Bikita. <laughs> Next we have Harun Tuline, um, who works for Positively UK, but you've been working in HIV for, for many years. Yeah, since, since your 2016. Since 2016. And since your diagnosis with monkeypox, oh my goodness, you've been sharing your story yes. far <laughs> and wide, tackling that monkeypox stigma. So, Haran. How many people, how many organisations and media interviews have you done since then? <laughs> so you wrote a first, isn't Excellent. <laughs> and, and, and your favourite? Um, you're my favourite. Yes, you're you. you. My face is really bloated <laughs> and you know what, I'm in a, in a sick bed. You were in hospital, yeah. So in the thank corner you. to talk to you, but it was, of course, it was the first one. And yeah. Then, well, thanks to you, the things speed it up. So who, so you've done like WHO, um, UNAIDS? Um, WHO first decided to go with patient experience and then United nations decided to share it with everybody um, and then I don't know all then it the word spread and all around um, I think Canada China Japan Norway Spain America is just <laughs> suddenly Fantastic. Like, famous for all the wrong reasons I said <laughs> brilliant get your autograph later thank you next we have Dr. Kyle Ring um, Kyle is a uh, HIV consultant at Barts Hospital. Um, you're on the, the special interest group of uh, BASH and a trustee of Stonewall. Mm -hmm. so thank you very much, Kyle. Thank you for having me. So you were also at UK Black Pride. What mm. was your highlight, apart from meeting me? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of course. You know what? Similar to Bikita, like... I, it was the people, like, mm. the event was the event, there were lots of great performers, but actually, it definitely wasn't the cues for the bar. Oh, I it know, was, right? it, was, <laughs> it was the people, and actually, you know, seeing so many black and brown people just out and proud, and in East London, like I was saying, it's where I'm from and it's where I grew up, so for me, being in that space was really, really special. Fantastic, that's mm. very cool, but yeah, next year, I think, less, less queuing, would you say, <laughs> for the bars. Yeah. Then, and that doctor... Dr. Rob James, who has a PhD in HIV activism, is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's the history of it, well, okay. the doing of it. Well, I think I will have to read the biography that you sent over. Robert James has been living with HIV since before it was even called HIV. He currently teaches social work at Sussex University and is really only here because infection from blood products is a topical news item. 
Yes. <laughs> Thank you. He does not have a PhD in, in HIV <laughs> activism. Like, what the hell? As some people think, it's much more boring than that. He's also a trustee of Positively UK. It's a PhD in HIV activism, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> As I say, it's the history of it, not the doing of it. I know what people did, not how to do it. Okay. So any activism tips? He's, he's your guy. <laughs> Everyone. It didn't necessarily always work what we did in the past. <laughs> very true, but, but thank you very much. And finally, Fungi Morale. Fabulous shoes. Fungi as well. Oh, thank thank you. you very much. Uh, Fungi is a researcher in the uh, HIV field with a special interest in mental health, quality of life and young women with HIV. You, she currently works as an independent consultant as a, and is a board member of Beyond Stigma, SWIFT and a member of the 4M network of mental mothers. Yes. So tell me about your shoes. Did you wear them all the way here today? <laughs> no, 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 no. I did not. Do you know, I've got two children. One's 18, one's eight. When I had my 18-year-old, I could run in snow and, and <laughs> fields and everything and giant high heels then. As I got older and menopause came knocking on the door and everything like that, it's just you walk until you get to the door and your flip flops, <laughs> then um, then you change them. Hence, I always carry a big, big bag to have the shoes and the fan and, and everything else. Um, absolutely, I can relate to that. I did not. <laughs> I sat down and put these on. So yes, totally can relate to that. So I've had some questions that have been sent over ahead. Uh, anyone watching, do please get your questions over on Facebook and Twitter. But I will pose the first question to Bikita. So we know that despite the huge advances in HIV treatment and care, HIV-related stigma still continues to blight the lives of people with mm -hmm. HIV globally. But we often don't discuss actually what is stigma? How would you define it? And what are the different types of HIV-related stigma? So I would define HIV stigma as a specific kind of discrimination that people living with HIV experience, or maybe people who are assumed to have HIV, even if they don't have it, experience. And it can impact all aspects of our life. So I'm living with HIV as well. So it can impact a whole range of aspects of our life in terms of the care that we receive we're in a, in a medical setting sometimes the response we might have from romantic and sexual partners sometimes within a work environment as well we might be treated differently mm. we might be treated worse that's what hiv stigma is it's about the discrimination um, and some of the different types of hiv stigma there might be something that we call enacted stigma so that what we're experiencing from the people around us potentially whilst living with hiv and then there's also self-stigma, so how we might feel about ourselves, um, how it might impact whether or not we go into a medical setting to ask for treatment. It might impact whether or not we feel that we're able to go and have um, romantic and healthy relationships and supportive relationships. Um, and not everyone experiences HIV stigma, mm. um, but it is, it is a valid concern and it's something that needs to be addressed. Yeah, but thank you. And, and Rob, what was HIV stigma like <laughs> when you were diagnosed in the 1980s? Um, well, it, it feels a bit like these ter terrible war stories. Oh, it was so much worse back then. And it was horrific. Um, I mentioned just before we started about remembering having the wheels on the surgical trolley I was lying on being bleached just in case. I hadn't even been cut open at that point, but the bizarreness, the fear then. The thing though that I feel now is, even if it's not as bad as it was then, that doesn't make any difference. If you're diagnosed now, it's horrible stigma. Mm. You don't think, well, it was so much worse 30 years ago. Um, you think, this is wrong, what's happening to me? Um, the way I feel about myself is not the way I should be feeling about myself. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and Greg, I'm, um, I know THT have recently done some research about attitudes um, of the general population about people living with HIV. W what do we know now? So what we know is it's, not, it's still not great, but it has got better. So we have a few kind of tent, tent poles that we've been able to, to ascertain through surveys. So the, the good news is it's getting better, but the bad news is uh, 
uh, the reality of the situation is only about a third of people would be comfortable dating someone with HIV. And it's about the same uh, for, for, to, to kiss someone living with HIV. But that goes right down to about a fifth. Only a fifth of the people surveyed would feel comfortable having sex with a person who is living with HIV. Now, we've seen huge, huge uh, developments, not just medically and biomedically, but we've seen a, cult a cultural shift within certain communities about the U equals U message, which is undetectable uh, oh. equals untransmissible. Uh, so, so that message has really kind of rung wrong home for certain groups, still not you know, right, ac right across uh, the communities that are impacted by HIV. So it's changed a lot in the last seven years, but there's still a lot of work to do. And I say that as a person who hasn't necessarily experienced any overt stigma or discrimination myself. But I know that that's not the same for everyone. Yeah, no, absolutely. Would anyone like to share any experiences of, of stigma? I think I'll go. I mean, I've always kind of like been very open that I'm a, I'm a migrant woman. It took me a couple of years to uh, become documented. And I think during that time, it was more the self-stigma that uh, hounded me. Knowing that I can access free HIV medication was one, one thing, but being diagnosed and not having access to um, counseling or anything else to support me through this journey, that, that, was, that was a very lonely and dark place for me. And then it's still now that I'm documented, I'm working, I'm contributing to society. I find it very difficult when I go to the GP that I have to educate the GP on why I need my, my, my smear every year and why now that I'm experiencing um, <clears throat> the menopause, I still don't have access to HRT because I'm still not the age bracket that a woman a woman should be experiencing menopause. So I think they they still some of those things like Greg said they some people may not experience it and some of us are maybe a little bit braver to challenge things like that but it's not the reality for every single person. Mm. Mm. There was a time when I was first diagnosed in 2016 um, and then my advocacy work started and six months later but in between I didn't know what to do there was a huge self stigma not um, having any sexual health education from before not knowing HIV I was thinking that I'm gonna die in a couple of years from AIDS um, and then when I went to the GP for my flu shot mm. um, they asked me do you take the nurse asked me if you had taken any medication and I said yeah I'm on this you know medication for HIV but I'm undetectable she stepped back and then she said that, I never heard undetectable. And I was like, so you are in the middle of London working in the GP and you never heard about undetectable. And well, I was recently diagnosed, so I wasn't you know, ready for a fight. But yeah. um, years later, when I started, I placed a complaint. But um, I, think, I think that also shows that lack of information and lack of um, kind of education in the healthcare system uh, needs updating as Absolutely. we progress. And that's causing more trouble to the patients as well as themselves too, in working in the environment. Yeah, absolutely. And, and kind of, why, why do people, <laughs> <laughs> not picking on you as a doctor, but yeah. why, why do people face stigma in healthcare settings more yeah. than anywhere else? It's, it's so interesting that both of your, well, actually all three experiences are in healthcare. You know, and that's so shocking that actually healthcare should be a safe space for people and it should be the place where people understand, you know, medically how it works. I guess, you know, humans, you know, healthcare professionals are humans and so they're influenced by all the same things in terms of media, kind of lack of understanding in that way. There should be more, obviously research has developed and some of that, especially some of the, the uh, data in terms of U equals U and really being able to say zero risk is more recent and so there are people that may have qualified before then and then not really be keeping up to date and I guess it highlights the importance for healthcare professionals to continually learn but then also you know maybe the onus is on us as as kind of healthcare professionals within the world of HIV to be continuing to educate other people and you know I've seen very similar things happen to patients of mine um, where you know people other healthcare professionals will be putting on double and triple gloves mm. and things like this yeah. still and you know we, we try to kind of you know educate and speak about these things as when they happen I guess it's a process and it will take time but it just highlights even more work needs to be done absolutely and, and what do you think we could do about the stigma that, that so many of us face in, in healthcare settings I mean, the thing with, I'll, I'll jump in to, to end the silence. The thing with stigma is it's, it's generally and usually born out of ignorance and fear. Mm -hmm. 
And so the more you starve stigma of ignorance and fear, it, it then is diminished and it, it, it gradually should fade out. But I think it's really, it's worth pointing out, stigma is also inherited. So we've inherited 30 years, uh, more, more now, we've inherited 40 years of, of stigma. And it's going to take a long time to unpick that. And generally, most people tend to act out of what they think is good and right. And sometimes mm -hmm. what's good and right might have been good and right 20 years ago, but it's mm -hmm. about it's about constantly unlearning and relearning. Um, so that and and I think it's you know it, it's it's good of all of us who are here. We work in this field, either as a job or, or advocacy, and it's a privilege to do that. But we are only people. It's good if we can be generous to educate the people we come in contact with. But I think it's a shared responsibility because mm -hmm. as marginalised and minority people mm -hmm. uh, of, of multiple different minorities and. Mm -hmm. um, our stigma comes from the majority. So the majority, mm. we are marginalized because the majority are ignorant. So we mm. can't do all that work. It's a shared responsibility. Yeah, no, absolutely. And what would you say is the, the link between homophobia and HIV related stigma? Could I just jump in very quickly in terms of the, the healthcare thing? I think, I guess when we think about stigma within healthcare, it comes down to simply education and understanding of transmission risk. Mm. And I think usually that seems to be what it is most of the time, people doing silly things. And then I think if we look outside of that, so if we look in kind of wider society, which moving on to kind of homophobia and, mm. and maybe even, you know, racism or, or anti-migration, things like that, then we're looking at things that are kind of more to do with society and structure and inequalities. Mm. But um, I think within, healthcare itself, I think the U equals U message should be enough to change that, mm. as long as that, that gets out. Yeah. You know. I, mean, I completely agree that um, if healthcare professionals continue to learn and relearn mm -hmm. about U equals U, but I like what Greg said, that they're also human beings. Yeah. We have to remember that these healthcare professionals are coming from various backgrounds, mm -hmm. that mm. they're going yeah. home to face what they think is not the moral way <coughs> of living. Mm -hmm. And how does that then, how do they bring that within their day-to-day -day job? Mm -hmm. We have to also be mindful of that. But this is not, this is not sort of me sort of giving them a, a free card to say it's okay for you to behave like that. It is coming to the table and having an honest dialogue. How, why, what makes you feel this way about me? Mm -hmm. And how can I make you feel at ease when I come into your, into your um, surgery? What can I do to make you feel at ease and do you need more information? Do you need Terence Higgins Trust to tell you that as a healthcare professional, you can learn about you equals you, and here's the link. What do you need? But I think it also needs to come from, from the top. If everybody, sort of policymakers, government, is talking about that and it feeds as a public health concern, as a public health message, then I think we'll be taking a much wider stride than the small strides that we're taking. Yeah. Okay. Can I add to that as well? Like on that point as well is that so I've, and many of us would have been in situations where we are educating our healthcare professionals. Mm -hmm. So like a few years ago, I interacted with a medical professional who questioned whether or not I could be working in a student bar, like I was a bartender at the time. Oh. And I had to say to her, that's not one of the jobs that I can't do. There are one of five <laughs> jobs that I can't do in the UK. Um, and now it's even less now, but at the time it was yeah. one of there I think were there's five. No jobs. Yeah, no. yeah, the, yeah. Um, so now um, be a pilot, yes. and <laughs> I can now be a pilot and a bartender. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But and I but I was going to say as well, but I think also I was able to self advocate because of a lot of the knowledge that I've learned from others living with HIV, from HIV support groups as well, mm -hmm. and I felt comfortable in doing that but not everybody will and I do think the onus is it kind of, it goes back onto your point about the onus really needs to be on medical professionals mm. fixing up and educating themselves and not always relying on people living with HIV to give them the up-to-date knowledge mm -hmm. yeah um, and so maybe I should kind of take back then what I said because I feel like we've moved on from talking about it strictly being about transmission to maybe sometimes feeling judged mm. yes. yeah. is that yes. true then so yeah. actually maybe within healthcare there is also some of these social aspects are coming absolutely in. yeah absolutely yeah. 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 I was going to say actually it comes from I agree with you it comes it has to come from up above we saw the same thing with monkeypox because my GP called me to learn about monkeypox mm. which I'm just a patient I'm not you know <laughs> an expert in the field so it shows that the communication from government or maybe the policy 
uh, and how it how it's so important to bring down those knowledge mm -hmm. to from top to bottom so it will be a judgment free and open for conversation and it's also importance of lived experiences when we hear more lived experience we more normalize the conversation around mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. and it just becomes a normal day life thing mm -hmm. to talk about and not to not to be afraid of you know absolutely but do you think that stigma stems from the fact that hiv predominantly affects people from marginalized communities mm -hmm. and if we can like go back to like homophobia I and yeah i think it very much did because that's where it came from you used a nice phrase about stigma being inherited and to a large extent when aids first appeared the stigma was inherited was well, a different from, stigma inherited yeah, yes. <laughs> homophobia from gay men mm -hmm. um and also that point about being judged certainly Lots of people diagnosed with HIV early on in this country, if they were not gay men, they feared being judged as well, yeah, it being mean, assumed they were. Yeah. And lots of gay men who were in the closet didn't want the world to know yeah. and mm -hmm. felt that that was exactly how they would then be described. So that issue of feeling you're going to be judged, even if you're not, but also being judged, mm -hmm. has such an impact. Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. And, and has homophobia impacted on you? her own particularly when you of lived course. in Turkey of course well I, I was attacked in Turkey physically by three people just because they saw me walking out of a gay bar but um, and, and that was the reason I ran away from Turkey the homophobia but because there's no sexual health education as well when I came here and diagnosed with HIV I immediately thought that oh okay of course I'm gay and I had to have it but then I learned more learned about it and I just more looked around and be people like this amazing people like this I realized that this is not you know on the belongs to a certain group of people. And no condition is actually belongs to a certain group of people because viruses don't listen to any borders. Yeah. But um, unfortunately, it still happens when I was in an event with THT, um, um, somebody, and talking about HIV, and I asked somebody if they ever test, get tested for HIV. And he asked me, why should I get tested? I said, well, are you having sex? Yeah, so then maybe it's better to get tested. But, but, you know, I didn't know, I didn't have any symptoms with HIV when I was diagnosed with it. And then he's, he, he was standing there and asked me, are you gay? I said, yeah. So that, that explains your, mm. your question. And this just happened like a couple of years ago, actually. Mm. So it still stands there in a certain group of people saying that, oh, you are gay. Of course you're going to get HIV. Mm -hmm. And it's also, again, lack of education, sexual education in mm. schools, not teaching about this from early stages. Mm. That just boosts it up, actually. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, yeah. I was just going to say, you know, I guess some of these examples are very much about how the outside community deals with that. But even within queer or specifically, I guess, gay communities, there's also a lot of kind of stigma and judgment that comes along with it. And, you know, I think part of that is is kind of it comes down to respectability politics. And so we have mm -hmm. people that are pushed you know, people that are kind of ostracized from society within that, then you get people that try to legitimize themselves and say, well, we may be gay, but, you know, actually we, we don't do this or we don't do that. So then it turns into a thing of, well, we're gay, but we're not that bad because we don't have this or that or whatever. So I think it then turns into, you know, something where even within the community gets so much judgment and so much, mm -hmm. you know, rejection, which is, which is, you know, again, completely fueled by the same stigma. Yeah, absolutely. And and in your work at Stonewall, I mean, it's been absolutely appalling the the backlash of, against people from from trans communities. Do you think that this this what they like to call like like anti woke agenda is actually going to make stigma worse for so many people? Yeah, I guess you know, yeah, the anti woke. <laughs> agenda is quite, quite complicated in itself and I guess it comes down to people disliking kind of people be, I guess owning their identities and who they are and, and kind of understanding the experience of those people um, and so I think yes and no I think I think it goes both ways I think we're also making so much headway and you know Stonewall have done a lot of uh, you know recent research looking again at public opinions of, of trans people in the UK and actually the majority of people don't have an issue with with trans people at all. But what we do is we hear probably more from that that uh, vocal minority, unfortunately. Right. And black women face intersecting forms of, of, of stigma, um, particularly um, black women from migrant communities. Um, what, what's the experiences that you, you're hearing uh, about from Gay? I think there are so many appalling experiences. I mean, I'll say appalling first, but I also want to highlight that there through advocacy, through peer support, and through other organizations, we are getting a little bit better. 
but through the work that I, that I do mainly at uh, the 4M network, we are still hearing that there are so many barriers that women from, um, from our communities, from the BAME communities that are facing, so many inequalities within healthcare, but also within our communities themselves. There's this othering within the community rather than coming together. Did you hear, she's living with HIV. Instead of just coming together and saying, do you know what? If we do this, if we exclude Fungi from the community, where's she gonna get help from? Or if then HIV comes knocking at your door, where are you gonna get help from if we're not dealing with it within communities? And also asking for services that meet us where we are as BAME people, uh, black and um, brown people living with HIV, women living with HIV. Because one service that is for you guys is not gonna be the service mm -hmm. that I should be accessing. But we cannot, as, as women, as women of color, we cannot sit back, we cannot afford to sit back to wait for other communities to start the advocacy. We need to be at that starting point with everybody else. And I think this is something that I, that I always try to highlight because we're not gonna get rid of all these inequalities if we're not having a seat at the table. If there's no seat, mm -hmm. then bring a chair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think some of that, again, you know, there are parallels, aren't there, really, with this idea of against judgment within the community. And I think within immigrant communities or even generally in black and brown communities, there's that, you know, the concept of the good immigrants and mm -hmm. the way that, that you yes. know, we hold ourselves, <laughs> yeah. we, we hold ourselves to this, this higher level, like we have to be this. And, yeah. yes. and again, we can't ignore kind of wider political kind of rhetoric with, where, where we have our own politicians talk about swarms of people entering the country. Mm -hmm. And then the thought of those swarms of people also having diseases that can mm. be, you know, mm -hmm. transmitted, again, it feels worse. Again, that's why people, trying to become more respectable, trying to be more accepted, will then reject those other people in society yes. to try to, you know, bolster their own position. And it's it's so unfortunate, rather than finding unity, actually, there's that infighting. Yeah, that's... I, mean, I still know that from my community, when I say to people, I'm a, a, a consultant in public health and HIV, they're like, really? You talk about that openly? You mean you left your job that wasn't about to do with this? You yeah. know, so it's, it, it, it is that othering that, that shouldn't be there within mm. communities. Absolutely. Mm. and and. Keita, what role do you think racism plays in, in the stigma that, that people of colour experience? I think it feeds a lot into what's already been said about homophobia. I think the fact that HIV stigma is so rife and it does impact the most minoritised within our communities is not a coincidence. Um, and I think especially w there have been some... I think media is generally getting better but there have been some links between, you know, migrants, black and brown people, who has HIV, who doesn't have HIV, as much as HIV has definitely been linked to gay men and has been kind of, that discrimination has been rife there as well, but it's also been associated with black and brown people, but particularly people of African origin. And those kinds of racisms and those kinds of stigmas then do impact our self-stigma, mm -hmm. our comfort or discomfort in getting tests, our comfort or discomfort in taking medicine after we've received a, 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 an HIV positive diagnosis. And it is all really interlinked. And then also the importance of, you know, cultural appropriate um, medical care that mm. where if you're a black woman or just a black person generally medical professionals thinking about the appropriate ways to engage us whether it's in terms of testing about whether or not we're gonna formula feed or breastfeed our babies about menopause just having those cultural sensitivities you know absolutely and with the research that, that you're doing at Oxford University what role does stigma play in the, the breastfeeding choices that um, women make? Yeah, so, so in terms of, so Nourish UK, HIV and infant feeding study, and ultimately the question that we asked was, how have you decided to feed your baby? Within the context of the UK where formula feeding is encouraged, but um, women and birthing parents can be supported to breastfeed if they meet certain criteria. So the main one being undetectable viral load, but there are others too. 
And I would say first and foremost from our studies, regardless of, we only spoke to women, cisgender women, and all of the women, regardless of the decision that they made, their priority was the well-being of their mm. babies. So whether they chose to formula feed or breastfeed, the priority was the well-being and the health of their babies. And in terms of how stigma fed into that um, decision, interestingly, when we talk about HIV stigma within a medical um, within the medical um, space, we don't often talk about potentially the stigma that people living with HIV face within HIV clinics. And it was quite mm. interesting to hear how the individuals that we spoke to who were in, intending to or had chosen to breastfeed, some of them f met a lot of resistance despite the Beaver guidelines supporting that. And I think it's an important thing to flag as well. Also, there was also the concern about, for those who had chosen to formula feed, the concern about the potential stigma of not breastfeeding within their communities. We primarily spoke to black and brown women where there is a higher uptake of breastfeeding. It is more normalised there. So that also fed in. But I will say, though, despite that, the majority of the individuals we spoke to still chose to formula feed. Um, and they and they chose to do that, um, and they spoke about the importance of their medical professionals supporting their decision and their partners supporting their decision. I think the last thing I'd say on it as well is that it was really interesting that the majority of the women we spoke to were in relationships, and most of them, their partners were aware of their HIV status. In fact, only two said that their partners weren't. So from about 20 plus um, who were in a relationship, only two said that their partners weren't aware of their HIV status. Right, okay, thank you. And, and just in terms of talking about your status to, to sexual partners, um, how do people find that experience? Do you think sometimes the, the anticipation of stigma is worse than the reality? It's, it's a conversation that I don't want to go into because after the, the in, in real life, when, I, when it comes to the dating, especially mm -hmm. on the dating apps, mm -hmm. it's a conversation that, you know, you don't know how it's going to end up. And if you know that you are undetectable and you don't really want to go there, then yes, there is, that, it, it, for me, the personal mm -hmm. choice, of course. But of course, it raises some questions afterwards. And when is the good time to share it? If something mm -hmm. gets serious, then, you know, it just becomes yeah. tangles up in, in, in a situation that you don't want to be in. But um, right now, obviously, I just I prefer to just share it um, up front and then get the conversation out of the way, you know, and tell the truth. But if I'm not ready to educate, yeah. uh, I just leave it. <laughs> yeah. I used to have a conversation with my consultant a, a few years ago, and I said, uh, at what point do you tell someone during dinner at, you know, starter, main course, dessert, do you wait for them to pay, then you run away? <laughs> or, you know, at what point do you say, Ooh, oh, but uh, I've, I think I realise that by not sharing my status, and this is, this is my personal choice, it's not the, the, the thing that everybody should do, it almost ended my loneliness because I had gone into this space of self-stigma of saying, nobody is going to want me. So I may as well sit at home, water my garden, and carry on with work. But then I thought, if somebody, it's not about whether they want me, it's do I want them? Mm. Yeah. And if I bring to the table everything that I am, then they're lucky to have me, Absolutely. really. And what are they bringing to the table as well? I mean, I'm, I'm a grown woman. So what, what are you bringing to the table as well? Like you said, when was the last time you had an HIV test? Yeah. Mm. You know, so I think it's just, it is that relationships, the desire of relationships can encourage a lot of self-stigma because mm. of the stigma that we inherited of knowing that if you start sharing the story that you may be rejected mm. or worse, some women in the, uh, from the black and brown community have stayed in very, very violent relationships mm -hmm. where partners have threatened them that if you leave, mm -hmm. I'm going to spread your um, HIV status on Facebook, on social media. Mm -hmm. So they stay there out of that fear 
and then I always say, well, if they're spread that you're living with HIV, they're your partner. People are going to also question whether they're living with <laughs> HIV or not. But yeah, that, that, that is the reality of some uh, realities of other people. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, I what don't do think doing it over dinner is a good idea. No? Rather uncomfortable silence. Yeah. <laughs> I think like after, 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 after the dinner, after they're paid? <laughs> Walking somewhere, walking. do it on a walk. That's much because when you have silence on a walk, it's much more normal. Okay, you think so like going and doing what something. I've done I was actually just thinking, wow, you have dinner. Like I have sex and then dinner, like date four. I was going to say, I think there is a difference. Here. Being, there is old, a <laughs> being an old straight man, I don't go straight for the sex. <laughs> you don't go <laughs> I don't know what you're missing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can be a, before I can get there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are a couple of things going on in in that conversation. So the first one, personally for me, I had a, <laughs> quite a unique uh, journey. So it's not everyone that is diagnosed with HIV, like broadcasts it to 150 people at an event the next day, and then releases <laughs> tweets and blogs that go viral, <laughs> and then ends up being yeah. in the middle of a prep. <laughs> With storm, so you know the cat was out of the bag for me. But I, I definitely had that anxiety the minute before I kind of spoke at that event and then pressed send on the post. I was like, oh god, I'm gonna be the HIV guy. I don't want to be the HIV guy. Like mm. this isn't going away. And and so for me, getting it out of the way was the first step of getting back to to I don't want to use normal, but getting back to me. So that was the first thing for me. But the other question I think we need to ask is really in an age of you equals you. Mm. Does the person need to know? Because if you look at the, the logistics of the law around uh, reckless transmission of HIV, if you're taking your medication, that in effect would circumvent any, any legal holds to you having to disclose. So I would say it's entirely up to the person. Um, if it's a quick shag or a grinder hookup or you're, you know, sometimes like we don't even talk when we have sex, you know, sometimes it's not possible to disclose. Yeah, so for, for, for me, it's, <laughs> sometimes it's better not to talk. Um, so for me, I guess it's, it's just really, really situation specific and person specific. But also yeah. I say that and I have to say this now as, as, as a cis white man, or, you know, reasonably comfortable and privileged is that I, there's no collateral damage for me. Mm. So my community embraces that message. My community talks about sex. I'm not going to be ostracized. I don't have a job where I'm going to be fired. I don't travel to parts of the country where it's, you know, I can't take my ARBs, my, my treatment with me. I have very limited collateral damage and a huge amount of privilege. And that doesn't go just because I'm gay or just because I'm living with HIV. And so I think that's kind of why people I keep, I keep screaming at like cis white gays, like you have to, even if you're not living with HIV, like you have to, you have to do something, you utilize your privilege and it's, you know, we don't always get it right, but there are people who, who either can or, or need more than we do, or need something different, I would say. Mm -hmm. I, different. I would say on that point as well, that I definitely agree with you in terms of in our own time, in our own way, yes. we are all though speaking within a UK context, yes. yeah. and not yeah. everyone, not everywhere in the world has as what I would like to call HIV-friendly laws and policies. Yeah. Yeah. The UK actually, there are more laws that protect us than there are that harm us. So I think it's just important as well to think about if you are making those decisions around telling a sexual partner or not, it's not for us to tell you what you should do, yes. um, but to also to consider the laws and the policies of your land, because there are people who are facing punitive laws in that respect. Yeah. I was also gonna say that in terms of you know that power, it was one of the reasons why I chose to live openly with HIV. Mm. It was to kind of take that power away from any potential situation where it could be weaponized in the future within a romantic relationship. Now, I'm kind of similar-ish to you in that it's kind of, it's everywhere. So if I'm dating <laughs> someone, I'm gonna tell them pretty soon. Yeah. Like, it's not like a wait a few weeks situation. Because they would, it's done. It's literally like, oh my gosh, you know my full name? Okay, yeah. I guess I better yeah, tell you my two faces her. then. Um, and I think now I found it in the era of you equals you, thank you very much, Bruce. Um, it's, things have become a lot, easier because in the days when it was like almost zero negligible Absolutely. and this wording it was very hard yeah. to cut through that so now yeah. that we can say it is zero transmission there is zero risk it's really important and I think going back to the role of you you've mentioned some people who 
can be useful in kind of spreading that message. I think also medical professionals need to be really clear mm -hmm. on that message outside of HIV and within mm -hmm. HIV mm -hmm. as well, need to be really clear about saying zero yeah. and meaning zero and not adding extra fluff to it, mm -hmm. it's zero. It's absolutely, but yeah. why do you think that some medical professionals are like gatekeepers of the U equals U message? Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly shouldn't be, and we probably need to be speaking about a lot more. And I think because it's spoken about within our very small circles in our own echo chamber, I think sometimes we forget the power of the message. Mm -hmm. And so we just actually stop saying it and we don't add it into our routine. And I know, for example, Laura Waters, who works more to a market, has added it into her kind of into the pro forma within the clinic that it's mentioned every time to remind people you know, because actually I think we just overlook it. But then I think outside of that, again, we need to be advocating outside of our specialty throughout the hospital generally, and maybe we need more campaigns. I mean, th there are posters. Again, these posters I just see in the sexual health clinic. You know, yeah. we need to be seeing them acro across the hospital and, and more widespread. I do have to say, I think there's so much power in these stories of, of kind of, of being in relationships and opening up and talking about it, because it's something that I encounter. Again, with pa you know, patients will ask and say, well, how and when do I talk to, to partners about it and you know there isn't a right answer and there's no right way to do it and it is personal and you, I always say you don't have to when I have someone who's undetectable at the same time holding on to something like that you have to think in the long term and if you want to be with someone is that how is that going to affect you mm -hmm. um, but telling these stories is just so important because I'm sure there's so many people that would find strength in, in the fact that you guys are doing that every day. Yep. So. Fantastic. So can I just also say in, in about the you calls you message again thank you Bruce we love you calls you I, I will wear a t-shirt, I will spread it, I will do whatever mm -hmm. it takes. But I think we also need to be careful that we don't stigmatize mm -hmm. others that for some reason cannot achieve an undetectable viral load. And we also have to remember that in parts of the world, in other parts of the world, they don't even have access Absolutely. to viral load mm -hmm. testing. Mm -hmm. So yes, let's keep spreading the U equals U message, but let's make it a reality for everyone. Absolutely, yes. and we have to remember that there are people around the world that don't even have access to treatment. Yes. Exactly. Right. So, right. So, yes. Right. So there will be yes. people who contract HIV and die before they even the, they can yeah. get a test. are diagnosed with mm. HIV. So it's uh, and we've seen this. I, I don't want to use the M word again, but we've seen this in monkeypox. Like, you know, I, I have been very public about grumbling about the amount of vaccine and trolling UK HSA. And I, you know, because I'm here in the UK, but there are countries where there have been monkeypox deaths that have not got access Absolutely. to any vaccine. And so it goes right back to that. It's, we, we don't exist in isolation and in mm -hmm. vacuums and inside. Look, it has to be global, a, a global approach to this. Otherwise, you know, getting to zero by 2030 is a nice tagline yeah. but it don't mean jack unless <laughs> exactly. unless you're looking after your neighbors right absolutely on, yeah i've got, had a, a question from the audience i'll, I'll pose this to you Haran. Yeah. Um, has the emergence of monkeypox um helped destigmatize hiv do you think well um i'm interested in this no break <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, um, well, for me, it, it brought up a new uh, conversation because when I went public with monkeypox and I, when I had, because I wanted to share it, because what res resonates in my mind was a journey you all have been through and everybody who's living with HIV been through. And I was thinking like, oh, is this what they faced like 30, 40 years ago when HIV first came around? Because when the nurse was calling in me in the hospital saying, that, so do you want monkeypox to go on your health record? And I was like, um, um, yeah, but you know, I didn't, mm. well, I didn't know this is a question. And then it suddenly just kind of light and light. Oh my God, this has been what's happening with HIV over the years. Mm. So this is going through the same path. So I always been open, but not only in the UK, not out of the mm. UK or in my hometown. But obviously with monkeypox, the HIV conversation came through because I saw that it was steering in the same direction. So uh, people were blaming sex for it. Um, I insist on they need to have sex and see how fabulous it is before blaming sex for anything. <laughs> and then um, gays for it because the spread is widely in between gay, bisexual, MSM communities. But they have to look at the reasons because it's such a you know, smaller community to spread is much quicker than the other communities rather than blaming. And then the scientific facts that viruses don't listen to borders, which Claire oh. Orkin explained it in monkeypox research very clearly, which when we had lots of um, women and children right now being affected with monkeypox. So obviously the, the story around stigma 
going very hand to hand and very in a similar direction. Yeah. But when we have a conversation, more conversations around it, and then people see more lived experiences, I think they just, you know, the stigma is being broken up uh, much more. Um, but yeah, um, it is very going, very much going hand to hand. Right now. <laughs> it's strange that it's talked about as a sexual disease. It's a foreplay disease. <laughs> it, uh, yeah, for me, it was a foreplay <laughs> disease. Foreplay. Uh, let, me, let me make Again, it clear. Again, it's nice that you're having foreplay. <laughs> 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 Those feedback actually you can see on the social media on YouTube or Twitter the feedback that if he could if he could keep his pants on or oh. if he if he wasn't gay or living with HIV, he would that kind of it's just what kind of relationship that me being gay or me living with HIV has with monkeypox at all. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I mean the vaccine scarcity scarcity, sorry, and the hierarchy of eligibility has not really helped with no. the stigma because it's kind of like if you want to make a colloquial it sluts to the front of the queue is kind of what you're hearing on, on social mm -hmm. media and that's you know that's understandable like 10 partners in the last 12 months and down to five partners in the last three months in some clinics so while we understand how that is good public health with the scarcity of vaccine it actually when it's just out like that in a community that's anxious and, and tense and struggles with stigma sometimes is and wanting to be accepted and normal and a yeah. good gay yeah. and I'm not that kind of person and I don't go to saunas it's actually it's a melting pot of chaos yeah. really. it is and I think it wasn't they didn't think about the people who are really it just boosted stigma if people are not out with being gay bisexual or MSM and if but, but when we are offering it only to a certain community, which is spread as wide, which is the wise, wise thing to do, but they don't want to be seen in there. So if we don't offer anything for those people who are just who wants to access the vaccine, who are eligible, but who are afraid of external stigma, mm -hmm. or also sex workers. We don't think about sex workers, female sex workers mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. can be eligible for the vaccine. So um, it kind of it helped, yes, maybe control the spread a little bit. But it also boosted the stigma highly in certain communities, also in gay communities. I do have to say, I think with monkeypox, though, we have to recognise that it's something you have and then you get over. Oh, yeah. Yes. And so yes. it's momentary, you know. Yeah. And I think if there is any parallel, at least within within my specialty, it would probably be herpes, which people just don't talk about. And I feel like yeah. I've said it, and they'll do like a yeah. <laughs> because again, it's, it's, it's something that people don't talk about because it's a, a sexually transmitted infection, kind of that um, you know, people have for life and people don't like to talk about it. people have the same issues with, you know, disclosing to partners and blah blah blah. So actually I think there's more of a parallel with that than mm -hmm. monkeypox, which is, you know, a transient mm. thing. You know. Right, yeah, no, absolutely. And and Bakita, I wanted to ask you about HIV stigma and mental health. Mm -hmm. uh, how do how does um, stigma impact on people's emotional well being and mental health? Yeah, I think so we know that people living with HIV are disproportionately affected by you know certain mental health mental ill health especially depression and anxiety and i think that if we're thinking about hiv stigma the self stigma some of the real experiences that we might have as people living with hiv that does have a knock on on our mental health and then also there is mental health stigma as well mm. which kind of compounds um which compounds that experience. So in terms of thinking about mental health stigma, it's important that we're talking about mental health. And I think one of, it's interesting because I was part of a focus group the other day, looking at the experiences of black women um, and mental ill health and depression. And one of the things that I said that is despite being really aware of the mental health stigma that exists, being part of the HIV community and hearing mental health spoken about so candidly, so openly and commonly, it's commonly a word, mm -hmm. often, <laughs> um, <laughs> has really helped me to kind of strip through some of the mental health stigma. So when I've gone through my own mental health issues, which I'm sometimes quite open about, um, being able to find the help and find the support is really great has been really good, especially being London-based, recognising mm. privilege, yeah, yeah. Um, having that integrated mental health support within my HIV clinic has meant that I've been able to get the support that I need really quickly, which I really appreciate. That's really good because so many clinics, even in the UK, with the cuts, no yeah. longer have that 
And what support is the, um, like in terms of if, if a patient comes to you mm -hmm. and they're struggling uh, in t with their mental health, what, what support can you offer? Yeah, I mean, we, we are very blessed in London and I've worked in, in two kind of big mm -hmm. London centres. So, yeah, we have, you know, very specific HIV psychologists who know our patients and have known our patients for years and access to them is usually fairly quick. You know, I think through COVID, everyone suffered in terms of staffing and people being redeployed and that's affected things in some way. Um, at the same time, you know, our patients, yes, are affected by HIV and that's what's going to affect their mental health some ways, but actually our patients are, are multi-layered humans mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. lots of other issues as well. And, and you know, the NHS works by commissioning. There are very specific things we can do and really our psychology services are geared towards people with HIV specific problems so then all these other issues are still then left to a psychology and, and service that's struggling with with waiting time so you know there's mm -hmm. increasing access to psychological therapy which is called IAPT where anyone can self-refer so I would say if anyone is suffering with their mental health you can go online you literally put your borough and you type in IAPT and it will give you a way that you can self-refer for talking therapies for counselling or for for anything else basically and that's the same thing your GP would do. So you don't need to wait for your, for, mm. you know, for a GP appointment to do this. You could do that directly. And we, I often refer people that way. We have, we do have our inpatient, um, oh, not inpatient, sorry, our outpatient psychology service as well. But actually, we we depend heavily on the third sector. So you know, organisations mm. like Positively UK, Positive East, there's Body and Soul, there's uh, NAS, all of these really amazing organizations often offer counseling and group therapies and workshops and other amazing things for our patients yeah, wonderful yeah Pe peer support is incredibly mm. important yeah. and yeah. thank you can i can i ask you what work is sophia forum um, not sophia forum <laughs> for, uh, <laughs> sophia forum is doing amazing work <laughs> I, have, I have to say go sophia <laughs> forum but what work is the so full m network of mental mothers <laughs> doing in terms of <laughs> tackling um, self-stigma? So we, with um, your, your good self, Susan, we got a grant from Fast Track Cities and we're running, we've run two already, we've, we got a grant to run four, three series of uh, online workshops and one face-to-face -face meeting in November where we're looking at mainly self-stigma, uh, uh, but we're mainly focusing on self-stigma. So we're doing that work and we've opened it up for women living with HIV to A, look at what stigma looks like and how they can best advocate for themselves or within the community and where to access services as and when they need them. And during these uh, sessions, it's, um, it was really, really shocking to me that one lady had not heard at all about you equals you until last last month and also through uh, how they're going to nourish their children mm -hmm. they hadn't heard about the opportunities that are there should they choose to breastfeed because they'd always just sat with the if if I don't breastfeed then my relatives are going to say this and that but they'd never gone to ask so that that mm -hmm. that then um led to a lot of stigma but what I like about this, I've just got two statistics. I know Susan looks at me when I start saying statistics because I can, I can be here for yeah, ever. I, I love numbers. I love numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> so with the uh, stigma, um, we're calling it the empowerment uh, workshops. Uh, one question that we asked, I'm just going to go through, said, um, I feel I have good qualities, sort of just looking at a human being's qualities. Pre-workshop, 64% said they didn't have them. And after, 100% said they, they could wow. find their, their qualities. And the, the one that I really loved was, I, I do not feel shame about my HIV status. Before, about um, 80%, sorry, 11.8% felt that they didn't feel shame. Then when we finished, we were at 80%. Wow. That did, that. did that not thing. feel that's shame incredible. after. Because we started talking through what stigma looked like and what they can do for yeah. themselves and everything. And as one of my very good friends always says, I know you want me to, to be quiet, Mr. Sean Mellows, who's um, he's always said, while we celebrate being undetectable, there is no ARV combination pill to tackle stigma. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Can, I, can I pick up on that? Because I, I run the same workshops, empowerment workshops in North Middlesex and Homerton hospitals. We specifically work with the clinic and get the referrals from the clinic in Positive UK side of it. And I kind of, I, I totally agree with you. The people who were referred are 
already been challenge, having challenges around stigma and they never ever talk to anybody about their HIV status or anything. They're just coming to the clinic and leaving from the clinic and not talking to anybody. Mm. And it was so difficult to break that self stigma a little bit to convince them to bring to the clinic. And we didn't, you know, we, we had five, six people in the first cohort to turn up, mm. but they really struggled. We re I really had to call them to convince. But at the end of the sessions, like you said, they all signed up for Positive UK services to get more peer support. That shows that actually we still have lots of work to do because this is happening in the middle of London mm -hmm. and we still need to do lots of work to reach out everybody to break the stigma and to help them. And, uh, we found that in Nourish as well. So we mainly spoke to people across England and Scotland and so many of them spoke about the importance of connecting with other mothers living with HIV, especially around that what does motherhood mm -hmm. and HIV look like. So peer support is incredibly powerful. Important. Absolutely. I've got, I've got a, a question from the audience. Um, from those of us who are peer mentors who do local advocacy, what tips would you give to help um, fight self-stigma or stigma in general? For the peer mentor? Yes. So Or for the people? Yeah, so so to, to help peer mentors help people fight stigma? I would say it's first having the self-awareness as a peer mentor to know what your limit is. Because mm -hmm. if you yeah. get burnt out or if you overstretch, then you're no good to anybody else. Yeah. So as a peer mentor, you have got to have that. As a peer mentor, you also have to be dedicated in educating yourself, finding education where it's available so that you're taking the most up-to-date, relevant information to whoever you're supporting. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And I would say linking into what Kyle was saying previously, recognising that stigma is multifaceted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So understanding why and how HIV stigma will manifest for that person that you're living, that you're supporting, not living with, mm -hmm. that you're supporting, and that it might be different for them than it was for you as a peer mentor when yep. you were dealing with your own stigma, self or otherwise. Absolutely. And if we've only got three more minutes, I'm going <laughs> to... <laughs> <laughs> we, could just, we could just like chat on for hours, couldn't we? <laughs> but um, just, uh, I think this one we can answer really quickly if someone um, c could answer this. Is, is stigma or discrimination against people living with HIV legal? I don't know if that's a, a UK context. Oh. I think if we answer it within the UK yeah. context, no. So people living with HIV are protected under the Equalities Act. We are protected under the per protected characteristic disability. So it means that we shouldn't be experiencing discrimination of any form mm -hmm. in regards to our HIV status within the workplace, medical setting and beyond. And that actually does extend to social media because the, the one time mm -hmm. I did have that, I was able to call on the police and the person got a caution. Oh, fantastic. So, yeah. The Equality Act covers goods and services provided to people in education and employment. It's not quite everything in society. Yeah. Um, and it's it, the protection starts at the point of diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you've got to be yeah. ill even. Point Fantastic. I agree with Greg. Please don't be quiet and please report it if you are uh, facing this stigma because it is possible because, mm. you know, since monkeypox happened, I've been taking down yeah, the yeah. Twitter account. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> and yeah. and also, I, I understand that there is an anti-stigma march coming up yes. very soon. Yes. Greg, yes. would you like to tell us <laughs> well, Susan, very quickly? Thank, thank you very much for that very subtle segue into this little, into this little plug. Yes, it's on Saturday, the 1st of October, and it's THD and about 20 other uh, HIV uh, NGOs and you don't have to be living with HIV it's anyone who, who wants to support people living with HIV who's impacted by HIV or who just wants to stand in solidarity uh, I'm gonna pass over to you because I know you you have something to say on it I just wanted to say to all the black and brown people out there living or not living with HIV this is a great opportunity to come and learn to meet us and to share okay fantastic and last really quick fire we've got one more minute one message in terms of tackling HIV stigma. Greg, could go I around? Gonna, I was going to swear. Uh, <laughs> be kind. Okay. Connect with other people living with HIV. Learn most up-to-date facts. Fantastic. Oh, I can't be quick, but I would just say like... <laughs> so, my, Doctor! My, my <laughs> is, is self-care and just, just recognising that when people are, stig are you know, stigmatising you, it says more about them than you. 
Don't underestimate the power that you have talking about your own HIV and the impact that has on other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The U equals U. Fantastic. <laughs> Undetectable equals untransmittable. And we have run out of time. I like to say a huge thank you to all of you. Amazing. Sweaty guests. <laughs> <laughs> Shiny faces. I'm so pleased to have a chair of my own. I love this conversation and could carry on. I'd like to say a massive thank you to the lovely Disruptive Live team. You are awesome. Thank you all very much for joining us today and join us when we have our next broadcast sometime soon. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.